Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to share the, uh, the, the psalm with you as well this morning as another point of scripture to hold in your hearts. Uh, psalm 41, verses 7 through 10. All who hate me whisper together about me. Imagine the worst for me. They say a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. This is the word of our Lord. As glorious as it is not, <laughs> as it seems to be, uh, it leaves us off on a bit of a, of a harsh word. But our word for today uh, focuses on our gospel reading. And the theme for it is mountaintops, because we know that Jesus goes up the mountain. Don't know which mountain exactly, but uh, we know that it is a high mountain, and he goes up with his disciples, Peter, James, and John. Uh, so let's talk about mountaintop experiences. We say that those are good times. Why? Why do we say mountaintop experiences? Or maybe, we, or maybe it's backward. We say good times are mountaintop experiences. Why do we call them that? Or am I... Pulling stuff out of my rear, Does it, that, that's what you say, right? People say that, okay. Well, I think it's because there's nothing quite like being high up on a mountain. It's just an experience that seems to be, it's not completely unmatched. There are other great experiences, but it is a great experience to be on top of the mountain. I've climbed in the Colorado Rockies, stood on peaks and looked down and been amazed. I've climbed in the Northeast Appalachians and been blown away by how far I can see. Some of you have driven up Brussels Hill and thought that was pretty cool, but it does not compare. It doesn't. Uh, if you've climbed or otherwise been transported to a peak, you know what I mean. It's amazing, it's majestic, it's awe-inspiring, it's a mountaintop experience, literal. Maybe something that connects with that. I want you to bring something to mind. And, and maybe that mountaintop experience or one of those experience for, experiences for you was your wedding day. Or maybe it was the birth of your favorite child. <laughs> or maybe some other thrilling adventure like skydiving or zip lining or wrestling a very small bear or something. These can be mountaintop experiences, assuming you survive them, that we maybe do once or twice, but we typically don't live there at the peak. We don't have those experiences moment after moment. Even if you're an adventurous person, you still might only take part in those adventures once a day or a week or something like that. We just, we don't live there and experience that high all the time. The mountaintop experience in our context for today is the event that, that gives you a spiritual high. It lifts your spirits and your emotions. And you know, I've preached on this holiday, this event, Transfiguration, enough times to know that German and Scandinavian Lutherans do not typically relate to this. If I talk about a, a mountaintop experience, you might go to a literal mountain in your mind. That might be where it ends. I have to spoon feed you the other ideas of your wedding day. You're like, oh yeah, maybe that was a mountaintop. Or uh, yeah, that was kind of an amazing thing when my child was born. That was pretty incredible. But if I don't give you the ideas, you like just don't come up with them. And so it's, not, it's hard to relate. Like you're not going to spontaneously break out into acclamations of joy, laughter, and clapping unless you're instructed to do so. That sound about, see, you're not, I didn't tell you to laugh just now, so you didn't know. So it's time to loosen up. So in order to get into the feel of the day for the, the majesty, the glory of the day, you need to stand up for just a moment. And there's, gonna, there's just a dance move of the day, okay? Now, I am not a dancer, so it doesn't really matter what I look like. But one, there was one um, uh, winter market where we were trying to figure out how to get people into the market and we thought, well, maybe one of those things is a sign. Well, that, that's good and helpful, because then it doesn't put us out there. But 
every time I drive by the um, Papa, Papa Murphy's up on Egg Harbor Road, I want to go in there. Not because there's pizza, but because there's a dude out there dancing around with a sign. And so you might have seen, you know, he's kind of going like this, but there's another one. Um, I don't know, it's, it's more for um, car dealerships or something where it's like the long arms. That's like the blowing thing. So that's the dance move of the day, okay? So what I want you to do is, is move freely, but it's a little bit spastically. So you're gonna kind of flop around like you have those super long arms. So it's just like this, like you're just gonna move around. And, and if you're like trying to attract attention and stuff, so you're like moving, you're not all doing it. <laughs> get on it, children, get on it. <laughs> you're going around. Okay, sit down, you're good. Okay. So, th all right, she's gone, she's gone. That's, we lost her all together. This is no longer, yeah, the dancer actually leaves. Well, she's just ashamed, actually. That's the way that goes. The mountaintop experience is where we find Jesus taking Peter, James, and John with him. Now, I, I don't know what he told them to get them to go up the mountain, uh, but it, it for sure started for them as a physical exercise and turned into an amazing spiritual experience that probably took them out of their comfort zone from just disciples, just fishermen, just ordinary guys to experience this amazing thing. And yes, they have seen miracles up to this point, but they haven't seen this guy completely glow in front of them. So what started off as physical exercise turned into a, uh, an amazing spiritual experience. They climbed the physical mountain only to be met by spiritual heroes, Moses and Elijah, and their rab rabbi starts to glow, leaving them dumbfounded and babbling. And the text doesn't say they were dumbfounded and babbling. It's just that the response doesn't make a lot of sense. So then a cloud comes and covers them. The voice of God comes, announcing Jesus as his son, and then Moses and Elijah are gone. And then the disciples go back down the mountain. Side note, there is a, a point in our text, uh, if you have Bibles, you can look at it, but 17 verse 7, um, it says, But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. Well, last week, if you recall, we talked about Jesus using that word in, in the, um, uh, so the disciples were in the boat, and Jesus comes walking out to them, and Jesus tells them what? What phrase? Do not be, do not be afraid. Does anybody remember what the Greek was? Luke, do you remember? No. All right, we talked about it in the middle of the week, so I wasn't sure, but uh, may phobes. He says the same word here. So in just two consecutive texts, uh, we've got the same phrase. And if you, rem if you remember, this is a forbidding of being afraid, like you may not. <laughs> you just, not just you shouldn't be because I'm here, but no, you, you can't be. Me phobesta. Uh, do not be afraid. You may not be. All right, so that's a side note. And um, so go they go back down the mountain. And so that's the, the entirety of the story. They go up, they see the heroes, Jesus glows, they come back down. I know I said that people don't live at the peak. They just can't sustain the thrill of it, but still, the disciples tried. I'll put up some tents. Right, Peter. It is good that we are here, but this is a day trip, not an overnight. Last Wednesday, I played volleyball as I often do. Randy Watermolen is on my team. He was in the front row. And all right, he's a tall guy, he's a big guy, so he really struggles to, to, get, to get down, but the high stuff he's good with. So he was in the front row, and I got to witness one of the finest blocks I have ever seen. Just completely shut down what should have been a beautiful kill, but he got those big mitts up there and blocked it, blocked it for a point. I didn't serve for a while because I was jumping around and relishing the moment, that's not in my normal behavior either, actually, in that context, but, uh, but the game wasn't over. And so we, ha we had to keep playing. 
It was an amazing thing to behold, but there was still more to be done. And in Jesus' day, there was a separatist group like separatist groups like the Essenes who believed as if the game was all but over. So they tried to live at the peak, and in fact, they lived sometimes in a, in a fortress area, away from everybody else, on top of a, a plateau. They would live there. Uh, and they tried to live in that moment where God was going to send his Messiah to make everything right and good. Which doesn't sound bad all on its own, but they actually stopped living and doing what God was calling them to do. Because they were trying to live on that mountaintop. Some of those people didn't get married or have kids because, as far as they were concerned, there was no point to it because God was going to take all this bad stuff away anyway and deal with it. But that's just not what God was calling them to. And he doesn't call us to escape from the rest of the world either. Not to find those spiritual highs. Not to, it's, it's okay to climb the mountains, but we're not going to stay there. We have to come back down and be with people and live our lives. So Jesus told his disciples on the way back down the mountain not to tell anyone what they saw. Because if they did, it would add fuel to the fire of the separatists. When Jesus clearly desired community and for his, disciples, for his people to have a godly influence on the culture they lived in. Mountaintops are meant for glimpses, not for staring. They are meant for moments not for living. Last week I tried to emphasize the way, that, the way that Jesus taught his disciples by throwing them into the deep end, right into the crowd, because that's the ministry. That's where the people are. Jesus let the disciples deal with the down and dirty of the daily and sometimes brought them away from it all, but it was never the usual. Early church builders wanted worshipers to relate to this. There are many mountaintop experiences throughout Scripture. We touched on a couple with the children's message. But there's enough of them where uh, a person of God goes up a mountain to meet with God. And so early church builders wanted to reflect some of that in their architecture. Some church buildings then are designed with steps leading up. How many of you grew up going to a maybe a rural church or a small church where you had to ascend more than, let's say, five or six steps to get up in the front door. Okay, many of you had that experience. I served a rural congregation in Parker's Prairie, Minnesota, and uh, there was another rural church, uh, St. Paul's Miltona, and I, I think that was, that was several steps to get up, and it wasn't until the congregation got a little older that they designed it differently and put it in an elevator, but the point is to get to have that mountaintop connection. Not that you're actually closer to God when you climb those steps, but it, it related to these mountaintop experiences where people met with, with God. And if it's not the whole building, like ours is, is, is accessible, if it's not the whole building, then at least the altar, altar area like we have. And I like to think of our time together is at least a hilltop experience, if not mountainous. It's good. It is good for us to be here. God's sanctuary is a place that unites us under one roof and one truth. We come here having had different kinds of, of mornings. Some of you woke up were like, oh, I'm totally refreshed and ready to go. Climbed out of bed, showered, whatever you your normal routine is, and, and you made it to church just fine. Some of you woke up and you had to wipe the crust out of your eyes and stretch your achy bones, and, and then you got out of bed and got dressed and got ready to go and couldn't find your keys. Those kinds of things happen. We all have different kinds of mornings. And having had different kinds of things happen during the week, too. Having different reasons for showing up, even. But one thing that we have together is that we show up here as sinners. That we have talked about before that this is, that's what levels the playing field. That we all come with that issue. We have baggage, we're, we're sick, we're hungry, we're in need or want. 
and, or, and we make the journey up the figurative mountain following Jesus. That is what should draw us here. That is who we should be following here. We know that he can heal. We know that he can fulfill. We know that he can satisfy. We come here not to get lost in the cloud of the church atmosphere and to say all the churchy things and do all the churchy things, but to lose ourselves, not in church, but in Jesus Christ. Who is that? Who is it that the disciples followed up the mountain? Who is the draw to come to this sanctuary on a Sunday morning when it might be a little cold outside or a little uncomfortable to hop in the car or just tricky to get the kids ready to come here? The draw to come to a place like this is none other than the Son of God. He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah. He is the Messiah, the promised one, who had come to restore peace between God and man. It wasn't in the way that the Essenes thought it would be done, but it is the way that God had designed. And for us today, it is good to be here, in God's house, here, where the world goes on around us for a little while, and we have this time away. The truth is, the world is going on around us. We hold to ancient truths and sometimes ancient customs. But we are called to give an account of what we see and hear in these truths. We call Jesus our Savior. We call him our Redeemer. We call the Spirit our Comforter. We call God our Creator and Provider. We are called to take those things Things, those truths, what we know about the Lord, and to go back down the mountain into the world that does not immediately know or understand the joy that we have in following Jesus Christ. And we too might struggle because we sometimes go back down the mountain and then proceed to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But even in those moments, God's promise is that he is with us. It's important to remember that Jesus doesn't shove his disciples back down, shove his disciples back down the mountain with a kick to the hind end and, all right now, get back down to it. He joins them and he walks with you. So it's okay to descend. It's okay to go out. It's expected. And when you do, just as your whole self goes up the mountain to experience the Lord, your whole being goes back, goes out and back to wherever God has placed you to have influence. When it comes to sharing the love of Christ with people, your physical presence makes it personal. Your emotions make you relatable. Your knowledge makes you helpful. Be there for people. In all of those ways, Know what you believe. But your emotions, normally kept in check, let them be the vehicle for telling of your joy and hearing the good news of forgiveness. Let it be joy-filled. If you're trying to share with somebody what being forgiven is like, you might choose to do a dance that flails your arms around a little bit because you are free to do so. It's awkward, weird-looking, or whatever, but you can you are free. You are forgiven. Let people know. Let, them be, let those emotions betray how overwhelmed you are in being lifted up by fellow brothers and sisters in powerful prayer. There is something here on this mountain, and it's rooted and established in Jesus, who himself was lifted up on a hill and then on a cross for all to see that they might believe. How good, Lord, to be here. How good it is to know your power, to feel your presence. How good it is to know you and be called by you. How good it is that you go with us. Be our guide and defender. Comfort us with your rod and your staff until our life's end, when we shall dwell in your house, O Lord, on your holy mountain forever and ever. Amen.